You'll be turning to John 18. John 18 is where we'll begin in our study together tonight. John chapter 18. I'm going to express again my appreciation for your presence. I'm certainly thankful for all that are here this evening and thankful for your interest in spiritual matters as we worship together tonight. May the Lord be glorified. May we seek just above all just to know what He would have us to do, to seek to know truth. And that's what I want to study tonight, this idea of what is truth. And so the idea of truth finds itself here in John chapter 18, and we're going to be reading about that in just a moment. First, I just want to define truth as to what truth really is. Truth comes with different connotations, if you will, to different people. Sometimes we will think of truth as that which feels good to us. And so if I feel that it is right, then that might be something that I consider to be true. Another aspect of truth, depending on who you would talk to, would be to let our emotional view skew or give us ideas towards our own personal views about truth based upon, spirit, based upon excuse me, experiences, get that word out, and knowledge. So some experience that I've had, uh, some background would kind of guide me towards truth. That would be one way that it is defined. And the other idea that you may see, a third option, which neither one of these three are the ones I'm talking about tonight, is that you really can't know what truth is. And some would take that uh, stance that really, we don't really know what is true or what is not true. But I think all those show a distinction and, and a distinct difference between what I want to talk about in regards to truth. When I'm using the word truth, I'm talking about things that are based upon evidentiary fact, that it is without a doubt, and that it can be proven to be factual. Uh, just for example, uh, we had this event yesterday that maybe you were familiar with that uh, occurred, and uh, the moon and the sun uh, came and, and gave off a little show, if you will, in the sky. And the moon eclipsed over the sun. Uh, we have different kinds of eclipses sometimes. Uh, sometimes we'll have a lunar eclipse where the opposite is, and we're between the moon and the sun as the earth, and the earth will cast a shadow on the moon. And uh, obviously, when that happens, it is much like we saw yesterday, where there's a circular pattern over the moon, and that would be the shadow from the earth, because the earth is in fact round. But did you know that not too many years ago in the scheme of history, history of man that the earth was not considered to be round. That most people viewed it as flat. And they would think you were strange if you thought anything different. But yet when that eclipse happens, you don't see a line across the moon where the flat earth is. You would see a circle pattern. Maybe that's a bad example. I don't know. You tell me later. But you go with just very simple this. Two plus two equals four. It's fact. It can be proven that if I take two things and add two more things to it, then I equal with a total of four. Facts based upon evidence. And so that evidence fact leads us then to truth and what the idea of truth really is. So as we study truth this evening, I want us to look at fact and reality. In John chapter 18, and you'll see in verse 38... Uh, uh, John chapter 18, and in verse 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? Now, I am not convinced completely about what Pilate means here. Sometimes we will take a guess, and this is the danger that we have in taking and, and saying, well, I think something means this, or I think something means that. If we utilize truth that way, then we're utilizing it in an emotional appeal based upon what I want or what I think. But truth is not given that way. So if we think that Pilate means one thing or another about this, that's not truth. That's our opinion about it. I can only go based upon what's been revealed to know what Pilate truly means when he's asking this question. Is he asking, well, Jesus, who really are you? Or is he trying to ask, well, I can't really derive one way or the other about Jesus as to whether he really is king as is supposed. I don't know which way he's slanting this. I don't have evidence to point one way or the other. All I have is the question. But if I look and back up just a little bit, what Jesus says becomes extremely important and underlines the importance of our study today. Verse 37, Therefore Pilate said to him, So you're a king. And Jesus answered, You say correctly, 
that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. The truth about what? Well, the truth about the question. The question that's asked there in verse 37. So if I relate verse 37 and 38 to understand truth, this idea in 37 becomes exceedingly important then. So you're a king. The question is, are you a king? And, and Jesus' answer to that is, yes. Well, what's the truth about that? And the truth is what Jesus is emphasizing, what that very idea is. Pilate doesn't understand that. He doesn't understand the kingdom in that, re in that way, in Christ's rule. And so he says, I, I came to bear witness, that's the idea, came to testify that I'm the king, and that's why I came. Notice at the end of verse 37, he says, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Everyone who's of the truth hears my voice. What a phrase. I've got it here on the slide just to, just to show. My, my text had it all on one line there, but we're running over a little bit on the slide up here at the front. We'll get that fixed. So the idea is everyone who hears the truth, uh, or who is of the truth, hears my voice, has to do with one who would submit himself to Christ and to Christ's rule. The idea associated with it is if I am going to be of Christ, I'm going to submit myself to truth. I'm going to be of the truth. I'm going to recognize the fact about Jesus, and that's going to be paramount in the faith that I have in him. I cannot say I am a disciple of Christ and not appeal to truth. I cannot say I'm a disciple of Christ and then determine what I'm going to do, how I'm going to live, all aspects of service unto him based upon something other than what he has said. His words, hear my voice. That's the idea of what he's talking about here. We're going to see that in the study this evening. This is paramount to being a Christian. Turn back to chapter 8. John chapter 8. <clears throat> John chapter 8 and verse 31. It says, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And so he is saying something about his word here in this text. He equates it to truth. So I want to know what truth is. Here in the text he says, that it is his words. He says, he was speaking, he continue in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine. So the equation here is, you're a disciple of Christ. Truth determines, is determined by what he says and abiding in that. Skip down to the text of verse 44. He says, you are of, the, of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. For he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Why? Because there is no truth in him. How so? Well, whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So here's the position that he places. You have his word is truth and the contrast to that is Satan and his word is a lie. So there's truth and lie depending upon these two things. Jesus, the author of truth, Satan, the author of lies. Keep reading in verse 45. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? It's interesting. As you read through here in this text that he makes a challenge to the people he says, if I'm wrong, if I'm not telling the truth, prove it. Which of you convicts me of sin? I'm proclaiming to you to tell the truth, and if that's not so, where's the evidence that this is not the truth? There in verse 46, that's the idea. He says, if I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. This idea we're talking about. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. Note the phrases we've been reading. You're of the devil or you're of God. What's the difference between those two? Whose will you're going to do? Whose will? Are you going to be of, of, of the lies or are you going to be of the truth? Look, 
People may ask you what, what it is that you believe. People may ask me, what, what is it is you, do you believe? Do you believe Church of Christ doctrine, Coy? The answer to that question is no. No, I don't even know what that is. Scripturally, don't have any idea what Church of Christ doctrine is. I, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in preaching that. I'm interested in preaching truth. Nothing else. Truth. And if what I preach or anyone else preaches contradicts what Jesus says, it's a lie. It is not the truth. I do not want to follow lies. I don't want you to follow lies. I want to do simply what is true. And according to John 18, 37, where we started, that is essential to being a disciple of Christ. Truth is not an academic subject. It, as to, it makes all the difference whether or not I can be a Christian, not whether or not I call myself one, whether or not I can be a Christian or be a follower of Christ. I must submit myself to truth. It's not a matter of just going to a church. And it's not a matter of putting a contribution in the plate. And it's not a matter of partaking of the memorial feast on the first day of the week. Being a disciple of Christ is inseparably linked to the concept of truth right here, what he's talking about in John chapter 8. It's important to me for truth. And if, it's not, if truth's not important, you're not a follower of Christ. He says, everyone who, hear, who is of the truth hears my Voice. Look at John chapter 16. John 16, he's preparing his apostles for their mission. John 16 and verse 13. John 16 and verse 13. It says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes. He, he's talking in the context about the Holy Spirit, but look how he labels him here. The spirit of truth. It's, it's the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, that sometimes is talked about in an emotional setting. I feel the Spirit within. The Spirit calls me to do something. But notice how Jesus refers to Him here. He is the Spirit of truth. It says, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will disclose to you what is to come. Now note what the truth is about. Verse 14. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. The you in the context is not you and I. He's not coming to you and I. He's not reminding you and I about what we've seen and heard. He's reminding the apostles. The you there in the text is the apostles. And he's going to present to them the truth about Jesus Christ. And it's inclusive of a whole lot of things. It includes things about partaking of the Lord's Supper, for example. It, it includes things about whether or not Jesus is the Messiah. Whether or not there's forgiveness of sins found in Him. Whether or not He left heaven, came to earth. Whether or not He says something about marriage and divorce. All of those things are based on truth. Not based on opinions and what man's thoughts might be. The spirit of truth will tell the truth about Jesus. Look. There, there's a lot of movements, if I can use that word. There's a lot of churches that, that might say a lot about Jesus or, or, or have Christ on the name, on the sign, or whatever it might be, but what about truth? Let's focus on truth. I, I cannot know the truth about Jesus apart from what the Holy Spirit's work has been accomplished who revealed the truth here, it says, about Jesus. Turn to 1 John chapter 4 just to emphasize this. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 6. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 6. Notice the pronouns here. It becomes important to make the point that I'm, that I'm making. These things weren't written to us. These were written to the people then. We get to read their mail. We get the benefit of that to understand these people were trying to serve God. We're trying to serve God. And so these become applicable to us and we learn from them and we appreciate them as to how we can ascertain truth. He says in verse 6, we are from God. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. You see that listens to us? Well, who's the us? Well, it's he who knows God, really knows God. In reality, knows God. 
listens to us. He says, uh, he who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So that's what I need to know. The spirit of truth, spirit of error. I need to know which one's truth. And so the people he's writing to needed to know. You know, we, we, we think that, that differences amongst people just recently is an occurrence. They were dealing with differences and difficulties of false teaching in the first century. Trying to determine what was true and what was error. They were trying to do that then. And John's telling them in this writing, he says, listen to us. But it becomes important for us to know who the us here is in the context. And so people may say something, say this is listen to us. That's, that's us, that's me. But, but that's not what the context says. Look at verse 13. He says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us. That's what we want, this continuous relationship. Abide in him, he in us. How do we know? He says, because he has given us his spirit. We may say, well, there it is. He's given us his spirit. Wait, wait, wait. Read the next verse. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. The we there, the us that testify are those that saw. You and I haven't seen anything. They saw, they experienced it. This is, the, this is nobody alive today. This is the apostolic witnesses he's talking about here. That Jesus promised the spirit of truth that we just read in John chapter 16 and verse 13 that would guide them into all the truth. And so John writes here in the way that he says you can know the truth. You want to know God? You want to know truth? You want to be certain about that? Listen to us. Listen to us, for that's truth that's being given. That's why tonight, I'm just reading from my Bible, friends. I'm not reading from a creed book, not reading from a brotherhood periodical, not reading from some website or something of that nature. Just the inspired word, that's all we need. This is truth. Following his word is truth. An emphasis on the correct interpretation of this because we are interested in truth. I just want to know, and I just want to know what the truth is. Turn back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We've got some young folks in the audience, and, and they've had the blessings of, of being able to attend worship service and Bible class with their parents. And, 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 you know, at some point in time, someone's going to ask them, and they may ask us older folks too, uh, why is it that, that you go to church? Or, better yet, why do you go to that church over there? Why, or if you're a member here, I know we've got visitors, but if you're a member here, why do, you, why do you worship here? Why here? Well, if the answer to that question is because that's where mama and daddy went, that's the wrong answer. And if the answer is that's because that's where grandma and grandpa went, that's the wrong answer. I just hope that we have more to understand about what, what we're trying to do. And that's simply teach the truth. To not be arrogant, to not be prideful, to think that we've got a corner on the market of truth. No, not that. But that we seek to have a stand for the truth. That's all I want to preach. The truth is revealed in this revealed word. And that's what we're interested in here is the truth. And that's what every one of us ought to be interested in. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 13, he says, We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through <laughs> sanctification by the Spirit and faith, notice it, in the truth. Sanctification. That has to do with salvation. Salvation or sanctification, that's this idea that's being set apart. How are we set apart for God? In the truth, faith in the truth. But you remember, we just read in, in 1 John, remember what we read in the Gospel of John, the apostle writing this letter, witness to the resurrection, faith in the truth. Notice verse 14. It was for this he called you through our gospel. Through our gospel, that is the revealed word of these men who were inspired to write it, who were witnesses for Christ, 
And so, in 1 John chapter, in 1 John chapter 4, it was us. Our here, that's our gospel, not, not the Thessalonians' gospel, not, our, not grandma and grandpa's gospel, no, but these men who had the Holy Spirit revealed, through the Holy Spirit revealed the truth. And he says in verse 14, that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught. Traditions. Here, here, here's some traditions you ought to hold on to. I, I preach about traditions. It, it tends to just come up, one of those things that comes up. Sometimes traditions are, 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 are fine. Sometimes traditions are detrimental. And, and the scriptures talk about traditions that are detrimental. This is one he says you got to hang on to. What's he talking about here in this text? Traditions are just things handed down. But notice what he means by it. Hold to the traditions which you were taught. How? Whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Well, by words, not really an option for us. We, we don't have any living apostles today, and there's no one alive who's heard one to speak. By letter, though, that we've got. That we're reading right here. We've got 27 New Testament letters written either by apostles or prophets, men guided by the Holy Spirit, that were going to tell us the truth about Jesus. That's why we study this book. That's why we focus on to it. That's why we hold on to that which has been handed down. Not because grandma and grandpa believed it or because it's Church of Christ tradition for whatever that is, but because we serve Jesus, the King, who said, those who are of the truth hear my voice. And they enjoy the benefits of his reign as King. Let's look at another example. 1 Timothy chapter 3 We'll look at 1st and 2nd Timothy for a moment. <clears throat> there are a number of things that happen in assemblies, worship assemblies. Uh, you'll see all sort of, of aids uh, that might be used, and people will invite others to come and to see. Uh, maybe some sort of entertainment, maybe some sort of celebrity or something of that nature, but we don't do that. Uh, we didn't bring in a celebrity preacher to preach the gospel meeting this week. Uh, it, as, as I had someone ask me once, are you a big name Texas preacher? And the answer is no. <laughs> Don't ever want to be. That's not our focus. Well, why not? <clears throat> well, we just want to focus on teaching truth. Uh, the church here has Bible classes and we have lessons like we're studying right now. Why do we do these things? It's because we're interested in what he says here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 15. He says, in case I'm delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. That's what we want to be interested in, being a, a pillar and support of the truth. He tells you in the next verse what the truth is about Jesus, and that's what we, we, we seek to focus on. That's all I seek to focus on in what I preach and in what I teach. And, and, and there would be... All sorts of other things we might could spend our time doing, but that is what is of the utmost importance. Turn forward a couple pages to 2 Timothy chapter 2. That's, that's another letter from Paul to Timothy. He, he tells them, he tells Timothy in the, in the first letter there in chapter 3 where we were reading about overseers and how uh, deacons were to work there in chapter 3, and that's going to help the church be the pillar and the support of the truth, that idea. And here in this second letter... He writes also about teaching responsibilities in regards to his work, Timothy's work, as a preacher in the local church there in Ephesus. And notice what he says in verse 15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. If the church is to be the pillar and support of truth, and I am to be a teacher in the church or a preacher in the church, it is not my job to entertain you. And it is not my job to try to present a lesson so that you on the way out tell me that's a good sermon. Although I appreciate your encouragement. I'm not discounting that. But it's not, it's not my responsibility to be sure you enjoy the time that we have to sit and to study. It's not any preacher's responsibility to be sure that it's an enjoyable experience for you. 
Our aim should simply be to handle the Word of God accurately the way he puts it here in this text. And, and, and that I interpret it correctly. Verse 16, avoid worldly and empty chatter. Why? For it will lead to further ungodliness. A lot of things we could talk about tonight. I, I, I like telling a joke as much as the next person likes hearing one. I like, I like hearing all sorts of things that might be entertaining. He says, don't worry about that. Just work, work on studying. Do your work of an evangelist. Put in the time and effort to knowing the truth and then teaching it accurately. Why? Because the church is to be the pillar and support of the truth. Look in chapter 4 and in verse 1. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom. He says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. In verse 4, he said, or excuse me, verse 3, he says, Time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they want to have their ears tickled. They're not going to endure sound doctrine because people don't like it. People don't like being told what's right and what's wrong. And we just want to do what we want to do. We want stuff that's just encouraging. I want a preacher that's just encouraging and uplifting. I'm not discounting encouraging and uplifting. He just talked about there in verse 2 about being sure you're exhorting. But if we've got a problem listening to doctrine, that's the very issue he's talking about here. I don't want to hear about those other things that's, that's doctrine related. And doctrine is related to morality. I get that. He says there's going to be times when people don't want to hear that kind of preaching anymore, Timothy. And so what they'll do is they'll go out and they'll get the teachers that they want. They'll go out and listen to the teachers that they want. And I tell you, it happens today. It's not any different. We pray it's not us. It may have the name Church of Christ on the sign outside. Let's not put too much faith in what's, what the name on the sign is. But focus on what we're teaching and what we're practicing as to whether or not it is truth. A church dedicated to the pillar and support of the truth and having men that are willing to spend the time in teachers that teach just the truth. Notice this argument that happens in Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, there's an argument that, that occurs, a disagreement that occurs a doctrinal disagreement that occurs. Galatians chapter 2, and this is in regards to what happens in Acts, 5, uh, Acts 15. I won't ask you to turn over there, but you may want to be sure that you note it. Those two uh, passages go together. Galatians 2 and in verse 5 it says, Paul writing, We did not yield in subject, subjection to them for even an hour. And the reason he's talking about this is that there are some guys, some brethren who claimed to be on the pretense of being Christians, but they were false brethren, that's in verse 4, on this very critical issue from Acts chapter 15 on whether or not Gentiles had to be circumcised. And he says, we didn't yield to them, not even for an hour. That's going to cause conflict. Yes, it did. As a matter of fact, the way he describes it in Acts chapter 15 and in verse 1, he says, some men came down from Judea, began teaching the brethren, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas, it says, verse 2, had great dissension and debate with them. Huh. We don't want any of that. Now, which of us woke up this morning and said, I can't wait to have me a good religious debate today and have good religious dissension with others? That's, that's conflict, and we don't like that. And I don't like that. I understand it. People don't like to debate. But that's what he did. That's what he did. And you know why? It was necessary to engage in debate. He says, we didn't yield in subjection to them for even an hour. Why? Verse 5 of Galatians 2, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. He was willing to say something was wrong that was wrong in order to preserve the truth. If it's wrong, there's no reason to, to tiptoe around it. Just say that it's wrong. If it's wrong according to Scripture, it's not wrong according to my opinion, but if it's wrong according to God, don't be afraid of it. But far too many say, I don't want to be a part of a, of, of a, a congregation that does that. I don't want to be a part of a congregation that gets into arguments with others. Okay, you don't have to. But don't deceive yourself that you're a Christian. Because Christians are interested in truth. 
Everyone who hears, who is of the truth hears my voice. That's the way Jesus said it. That may be a little harsh. It's the facts of what we've been reading tonight. Jesus says if you're going to serve him as ruler and as king, you are interested in what is right and what is wrong, the truth. In Titus chapter 1, another preacher, Titus, <clears throat> on the island of Crete, and the various churches that were there he was preaching to, and, and he starts in, in verse 5 and talking about that he was left in Crete to set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city. And so he talks about these men who would serve in that capacity. And in describing them in verse 9, he says, holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort and sound doctrine and refute those who contradict. That's the standard for elders. That's the expectation that God puts forth for their work. In verse 14, he says, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. No, it's not that. We don't need elders who enforce uh, Reformation theology. We don't need elders who are just trying to be sure that everybody understands Church of Christ doctrine. Again, whatever that may be. We need elders who understand the truth and are willing to stand for it and hold fast according to the truth and expose error and refute those who contradict. That's the way that he puts it there in verse 9. That's their job. That's their work for God. So whether we're talking about preachers or teachers or elders or all of it, everything we've seen tonight, you cannot get away from truth. If I'm going to be a Christian... I'm going to be interested in truth. Let me spend just a few more moments and give some applications uh, for this. I think that will be extremely useful, as at least they are for me. Romans chapter 2 and in Romans chapter 6. I want to look at a couple there. Romans chapter 2. Let's start with this one. Romans 2 and in verse 8. <clears throat> Romans 2 and in verse 8. He talks about those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth. And we'd say, oh, you got, yeah, you got to watch out for those. Amen. <laughs> watch out for those with selfish ambitions, do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. You know, that's the, the care we have to watch for. And when you turn to chapter 6, notice what he says about those who had become Christians, which is who he's writing to, the church in Rome. In verse 4 it says, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was, uh, was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. There's a lot of different teachings about baptism. A lot of different teachings in Abilene about baptism. Uh, and whether or not baptism is essential or not, uh, whether or not one's saved before baptism or not, which is not the point of the lesson tonight. But do we see if we just say, well, it doesn't matter. You do you, I'll do me. And whatever you want to believe about X, Y, Z, all well and good, you just, you, that's fine. There's an importance to this. There's an importance to whatever God says about baptism. Look at verse 17. He says, Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So when they obeyed what they had been taught about immersion, about baptism, and they arose from the waters of baptism. They were free from sin. That's what he talks about in the chapter. Well, you say, well, I don't, you know, if, if another church wants to teach different than that, that's all well and good. That's not truth. It's not the truth about what he says here in the text. And Paul says in Galatians 2, I'm not going to yield even for an hour. I'm going to stand firm in truth. Don't be afraid to state the truth about doctrinal matters, including baptism. Say it with, with love and compassion, yes, but don't be afraid of what's true. You know what? People are not going to like it. You will come across people who will disagree, but the point is, are we going to follow what's true or not? Are we going to follow the king of truth? Turn forward a little bit more in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. I'll give you another example. This is along in the same vein. 
as to what these brethren did in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 1, in talking about uh, that they enjoyed every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, that's in verse 3. In verse 13, he says, In him, that's in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, they had received the message of truth, that is, he calls it the gospel of your salvation. So their salvation was based upon what was taught to them by the apostle. He says, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Well, what did they do? How, what was this gospel of your salvation? Well, I mean, if I turn to chapter 5, for example, and look in verse 25, uh, and, and he talks about husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her. How? Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. You know one thing in Christianity that has to do with water is baptism. Surely, surely that's not what he's talking about here. That this gospel of, of your salvation included baptism? Did they understand that? Is that what they believe? Well, we have a historical account of it. The historical account is in Acts chapter 19 when Paul was in Ephesus. And in Acts chapter 19 when he arrives in Ephesus there in verse 1, it simply says this. He, he went to the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. Now we would go, whoa, they're already disciples. But the word disciple does not mean Christian. The word disciple simply means follower or learner. Found some learners, some people that were willing to listen and learn. Well, what were they going to learn? Look at verse 2. He asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is in Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. These people we read about in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 5 are the same folks we're reading about in Acts chapter 19. And in Ephesians 1, they heard the message of truth that we've been talking about tonight. And it caused them to experience that washing of water with the word. That's the way he puts it. That is the message they heard. They were cleansed for their sins. They were baptized. Question is, what's truth? Well, truth is not what I want it to be and what you want it to be and what we like or what we don't like. Truth is just a fact of what is presented. What happened? What did they understand? If you're still in Ephesians, look back to chapter 4. Now it may relate to how we become a Christian. Is that just it? That the end of the rope for us? Truth only concerned with, with salvation. That's all. No. No. He says in chapter 4 and verse 20, you didn't learn Christ this way. If indeed you have heard Him and have been taught in Him, just as truth is in Jesus. There's our idea again. What's he talking about? Verse 22. That in reference to your former, notice it, manner of life, you lay aside the old self which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. So this manner of life, this has to do with how you live. So you're going to be a Christian. Okay. Well, I'm settled on all this stuff. Your baptism is immersion for the forgiveness of sins. That's truth for being the scripture. I did that. Check it off my list. I'm done. Not according to what the apostle's writing here. He cares about how you talk. He cares about how you use your body. He cares how you treat fellow man. That's Read the chapter tonight. You'll see it throughout. In any picture of Jesus that says, I got baptized and now it doesn't matter how I live is not the truth. He deals with it in this letter. In chapter 6, he talks in verse 10 that, that they were in this battle, that we're in this battle with evil powers. And, and in verse 14, you notice what's going to help you. He says, having girded your loins with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness. And what is it? what's this called? This is called the armor of God there in verse 13. So you're going into battle. And if you're going into battle, you want some armor. And if God gives you the armor, isn't that the best armor that you can have? 
The armor of truth, the shield of truth, knowledge and belief in the truth of Jesus Christ that enables you as he talks here in this chapter about overcoming the fiery darts that Satan may throw at you. That's why it's important that we do what we're doing right now and open our Bibles and look and study and determine whether or not these things are true. Not because I'm saying them and some of you may like me, that's not it. But whether or not it's the revealed truth from God, evidenced from Him. We started in John chapter 18. And Jesus said, essentially, I, I'm a king. Pilate asked him in verse 37, if you're the king, and he says, yeah. And the immediate question that should come from that is, where's your army? Where's your armor at? Where's your sword? Well, the idea is he's not that kind of king. That's not the understanding of his kingdom. He's a king over people who love truth. He's a king over people who are willing to do what he demands. That is what truth demands. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. That's how important it is. Let's end in Hebrews chapter 10, if you will, please. Hebrews chapter 10. In the Hebrew letter, these are some people who are wavering. They're losing confidence in Jesus. And one of the reasons is because they're, they're facing all these trials. And, and they're ready to get rid of those difficulties. And they just want to go back to a belief that would give them relief from all that difficulty. And so he warns them in verse 26. He says, if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. You've heard the truth. You believe the truth. You obey the truth. And now you turn your back on it? What do you have to look forward to? Look at verse 27. A terrifying expectation of judgment. He warns you about the vengeance of God in verse 30. He says, vengeance is mine. I'll repay it again. The Lord will judge His people Friends, I cannot overemphasize how important truth is. It's important to serving Christ. It is important to being ready to meet God in judgment. That's why it's, it has to be a priority in our hearts, in our lives, in our choices, and how we spend our time. I pray it's important to you to know what it is that God wants for us to do and to live according to His will. Thank you for your good attention this evening. I pray the lesson to be encouraging to you in your service to the Lord. We've got a time selected for us at this time that we use just as an opportunity for you in a public manner if we can help you in your service to the Lord. If you need to put on Christ in baptism, we're prepared to help you with that. If you need the prayers of the congregation in a public manner, if there's something we can assist you with, let us know as we stand and as we stand.